one person on the whole side. <laughs> Good for you, Sally. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever been in church where there's only one person on that side. So, first time for everything. It's a joy to be back with you after having the Pastor Kirk Hyde fill in for me last week, uh, visiting family up in Buffalo, and that was great. But it's always good to be back home and be with you, God's people here. So I'm excited to be here today as we go to our Lord to receive his grace and his word and sing our prayer and praises to him. Um, order of service today, Divine Service 1, we'll have it up on the screen for you. We begin with singing, Word of God, Come Down on Earth. <laughs> Sins. 
is a call of a main servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> himself, 
but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundred, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know how well you can see that from all the way in the back, but that is an etching done by Rembrandt von Rinn, the master artist, in 1636. And it's the return of the prodigal son. That's what that etching is from. And I want you to notice a few things in that etching. You have the, the father and the son together right in the center. The father is coming down the steps to greet his son. The son who had squandered his wealth and wild living, he said, Dad, give me the inheritance long before you're dead so that I can go off to a far off land and have a great life there. Well, the son finds out that that didn't work out so well for him. He's broke, he's destitute, and he comes back to his father and he throws himself at his father's feet. In this uh, etching, you can see the, the servants coming down the stairs looking where they're going, it's as though they're in a hurry to gather around the father and the son. It's all about kind of motion. Everybody's moving towards the son who has just returned home. It's a, it's a wonderful little action. Now I want to go to the next slide. Thanks, Dylan. So this is also Rembrandt. 32 years later, he painted the same scene. He goes back and revisits the return of the prodigal son. And notice how much different this one is. Now you can go visit this and see this picture in St. Petersburg, Russia at the Hermitage. That's where it's located. And this is one of the most famous pieces of art in the whole Western world. It's as though Rembrandt decides that he wants to maybe put into paint on canvas something that will last for a long, long time. And it's still something that many people value today. So he returns to that same scene, and it's so much different. Whereas the first etching is kind of about action, pushing in, leaning towards the sun. In that first one, I don't, Jane, can you go, or Dylan, can you go back to the one before? You can even see the father, he's got his knee bent and his back heel is coming up off the ground as though he's lunging towards them. Now go back to the other one. That's like a, that's like a still life, right? No action, no movement, just on the characters. So much, so much difference in the way that he paints it the second time, 32 years later. Everybody is stationary. All the eyes are on the Father and the Son. In the first one, the eyes were looking down as they are running down the steps, but no, here you have an older brother. You have him standing there looking upon <coughs> his younger brother who squandered his wealth and wild living is broke and destitute and is now throwing himself at his daddy's feet and the older brother's looking at him with disgust and disdain. But it's as though Rembrandt wants to freeze the moment in time when the father embraces the son and loves the son and welcomes the son and forgives the son and brings the son back to him. Now, Rembrandt seems to get the parable from Luke 16 or Luke 15. He paints the Father's love on a canvas which endures to this very day. And I, and I, want, to, I want to talk about this painting because it ties in so beautifully with what St. Paul wrote 
in our first lesson, or second lesson this morning. Paul takes that love of the Father, and he paints the picture of that loving Father, not with paint on canvas, but with ink on skin and upon our hearts. Did you hear what he said? For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by that spirit, we call him Abba, Father. We are not slaves to fear, but we are sons of God. And that makes all the difference in the world for us. Yes, sometimes, sometimes we act like slaves, we behave like slaves, we believe we're slaves, but we're not slaves. We are sons. Paul wants us to know for sure and certain that we are no longer slaves if we have received the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and slaves, he says, to fear. Fear because of sin and its consequences. But we don't have anything to fear, huh, do we? Our culture is certainly living in a time of fear. And it's a tricky balance, right, for us as Christians to figure out how much we should fear COVID-19, stay locked in our homes, sequester ourselves, put ourselves in locked rooms, don't come out of our house, don't get up for church, don't go out because we're fearful of what might happen. Paul says, no, we're not slaves to fear anymore. But I look around and I see all kinds of fear. People stockpiling toilet paper and food and gas and generators and survival supplies and guns and ammo and weapons and boy, I better be ready because this might be the last days. And I gotta protect myself. It's easy to live with fear. If we look back up at that Rembrandt painting and you and you focus on the sun. He looks more like a slave than he actually does a son. Notice his head is shaved. In those days, even in Rembrandt's time, prisoners who would be turned into slaves would have their heads shaved to mark them off as property. And that's the way he paints them. It was a sign of a prisoner. His clothes are tattered. His feet, I don't know if you can see, but only one of them has a shoe on it. And one's bare. And the one that has a shoe, well that shoe is hardly worth being a shoe anymore. It's so worn out. His eyes are closed. The one eye you can see. Because he's exhausted. And he's collapsing into his father's arms. And that's what slavery does. It exhausts us, it wears us down, it tires us out. The son, the son had taken his father's inheritance, squandered it all in wild living. He thought he would have a great life and a grand time in this far off place. But that very thing that he thought would give him a full life, it exhausted him. It wore him out. It darn near killed him. See, slavery always leads to death. Slavery takes away everything. And we know that story. We live it out far too often. All of us in the way have said at one time or another in our lives, Father, give me my inheritance. Give me what's coming to me. Let me go off to a far off land and have the good life, enjoy everything there is to enjoy. We'll have the time of our lives, we think, but that, that kind of slavery will only dispense exhaustion and tiredness, death. 
death and destruction. And we will be left exhausted and worn down, tattered, broken, beaten, and bruised. Because slavery just takes away everything. You say, slavery to what? What are we slaves to? We're like, we're like the people Jesus says, we've never been slaves of anyone. Well, you've been slaves to all kinds of things. Your job, recreation, your toys, your looks, your cars, shopping, money, clothes, leisure time, retirement, sports, a nest egg to get you through. Whatever becomes first place in your life becomes your God, and then you become a slave to that God, whatever it is. And we've got a great choice of gods in our culture today, right? What we think will give us life only dispenses death. So what do you do when you realize you're a slave, you're broken, beaten, battered, tired, tattered, and worn out? Well, you, you go to the Father. You remember the Son. Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven, and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your Son. You cast yourself on the Father's mercy. You allow him to grab you in his tender embrace and bring you back into his family. What does the father do? Well, if you notice in Rembrandt's painting, all the central light is right on the father, right? The primary light. Right on his face. And if you look up after church and walk up and see this image up there, it's not a face of anger. It's not a face that says like a parent often does. Remember this one? I told you so. It's not that face. It's a face of tranquility. It's a face of peace. It's a face that welcomes the sun. One other thing I want you to notice as you look up at this, and I don't know how well you can see all the way in the back, probably not well enough, but when Rembrandt paints the Father, he not only puts that peaceful, tranquil face on the Father, but he, he paints the, the hands differently. They are two different hands that embrace the Son. So, yeah, Jennifer's going to look it up so she can see better. <laughs> Go ahead and get out your phone if you want to do that. But the hands are different. The, the left hand of the Father that's reached out is open wide, fingers spread apart. It's a much bigger hand. It's a more powerful hand. It's a hand that shows the Father's authority and power and protection. And it's the hand that is reaching out and pulling the sun Close. Now, if you look at his right hand, it's, it's smaller, it's more slender, it's more elegant, it's, well, it's more dainty, it's more womanly, you might say. If you were to scour all of Rembrandt's earlier paintings, you would find this exact same hand on a Jewish woman in another painting. So Rembrandt paints the Father with two different hands. One hand, a hand of authority and power and strength and protection. And the other hand, a hand of care, compassion, and tenderness, and mercy. Because he knows that we need a Father who is authoritative, who is strong who is powerful, who can defeat all of our enemies. But we don't need just a father who is an authoritarian. We also need a tender father who is caring, compassionate, and kind, 
and loving. And so two different hands wrapped around the sun. And he gives us that great picture like that. What's interesting is that the hand on the left, the hand of power and strength, well, most art critics believe that that is Rembrandt's own hand. He often painted some part of himself into the picture. And Rembrandt was a father. He had fathered four children with his beloved wife. And so he knew. He knew what it was like to be a father. He knew what it was like to have authority with children. He knew what it was like to, to pull them into his embrace and care for them and protect them and to love them. And the father's face and the father's hands welcomed the lost son home. Paul invites us to return to that kind of father. He says, he says that we cry out, Abba, Father. Now most of you know, probably all of you, that the New Testament was originally written in Greek, right? But Abba is not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic word. An Aramaic word would have been the, the native language of Jesus and the disciples and all the people living in that area, though they probably spoke Greek as well. So, so it's an Aramaic word, and, and Abba means like daddy, right? It's used three times in the New Testament. It's used here in Romans chapter 8. It's used again by Paul in Galatians one time. And it's used by Jesus in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus is out in Gethsemane and he prays, Daddy, take away this cup from me. It's a term of endearment. It's a term that signifies a close, loving, caring relationship. It indicates that there is a God who is our Father, who is approachable, accessible, and we can bring to Him all of our slavery and all of our hurts and all of our fears and all of our misspent times and years, admitting our addictions and our Potions, this is your father. He's mighty, he's powerful, he's strong, and yet he's merciful and tender and loving. And he welcomes you not as a slave, but as a son. Verse right after this in Romans 8 says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. How does the Holy Spirit testify with our spirit that we are God's children? Well, the same way He testifies about anything. He uses the Word. The Spirit always works through God's Word. And what do we find in Romans? All kinds of things, right? Romans 4.24, Jesus was delivered over for our sins, and he was raised for our justification. 5.20, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Romans 8.1, there is now, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit testifies through the word that no matter what we're going through, no matter whether we feel like slaves to fear or sin or any other thing, no matter what we've done or where we've been or how we've misbehaved, we are still God's children. God's children. What's so interesting about this painting, I think, and the return of the prodigal son, is where Rembrandt frees 
Jesus' time in the story of the return of the prodigal, right? At this point in the story, he freezes it before the son receives any tangible gifts. You know what I mean? He doesn't have the ring on his finger. The father has not put him in the finest robe. The fattened calf is not slaughtered. The party is not yet going. The only thing the son has is the father. And that's enough. When you have the father, you have enough. I said that this painting was done 32 years after Rembrandt's etching of the same story. And a lot had happened in Rembrandt's 32 years in his life between the etching and this painting. By the time he does this one, his beloved wife is dead. Three of his four children are in the grave. He's broke. He has no money from all the paintings that he's done. And his reputation as an artist, well, people are saying he is no good anymore. He has lost just about everything. And the year before he paints this, his fourth child is dead. His family, all gone. All the things that this world says are most important in life, your reputation, your family, being able to take care of yourself and have money saved up, all of that was completely and utterly gone. He had nothing, according to the world. But I think if you ask Rembrandt, it's why he painted the scene like this. Because he knew when you have the Father, you have enough. You have enough. We are children of God. And guess what? We are co-heirs with Christ. And if we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. And he holds out that promise to each one of us today. Rembrandt etches it with paint on canvas, and St. Paul does it with ink on paper or animal skin says, when you have the Father, you have enough. You are an heir. You have an inheritance. No, he doesn't promise <laughs> an inheritance of a million dollar home or a mountain property or a great reputation. No, he says you are an heir of God. Heir of God because of the Spirit creating and working faith in you in the Son Jesus Christ. And when you have the Father through the Son empowered by the Holy Spirit, guess what? You are God's child and you have enough. Enough. He will welcome you into his embrace. Strong, powerful, authoritative, gentle, compassionate, forgiving. You are God's child. And the Spirit testifies with your spirit.
buried. And he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, hear the prayers of your people. Grant to us all things needful and beneficial, and keep us from all things harmful. Holy Lord, Almighty God, you are the strength of the hills and the hope of the ends of the earth. Give to our hearts your perfect peace, that we may not be anxious nor live in fear, but rest all our hopes, dreams, and desires upon your merciful goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah. our prayers. Holy Lord and mighty God, you sent forth water upon the earth that it may bring forth abundant fruit and feed our bodies with all that we need. Help us to be wise and faithful in the use of the rich bounty of the earth, that the poor may be supplied, and that we never fall to fail to give thanks to you for all that you have given for us for this body and life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Lord, mighty God, your word will not return to you empty, but will accomplish your purpose in sending it. By your Holy Spirit, make our hearts good soil for your word to be planted, that we may give evidence of a sturdy faith and show forth in our lives the good works that you have called us to do. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy Lord, mighty God, your spirit accompanies the witness of your people who speak your word before the world. Grant success to the missionary and mission planter, and to every pastor and church worker, that those who hear may believe, and those who believe may bear good fruit of faith in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, mighty Lord, you have given power to the nations, and those who govern to act for the good of your people. Bless our president, the Congress, our governor, all those elected and appointed to lead us that justice may prevail and your people may be free to live at peace with all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, mighty Lord, you know how weak and frail we are. Give to those afflicted in mind and body and soul the fullness of your healing grace, that according to your will they may be restored to health. Hear us for all those suffering and recovering from the pandemic's ravages, and for those who have requested our prayers, especially today, do we commend to your care Lorraine, Alan, Val, Peg, Gary, and Carol, Rod, Walt, Kathleen, Mark, Marcine, Dennis, Norma, Paul, Darla, Gretchen, and Helen. And for all those we name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, mighty Lord, you have granted us great riches and gifts. Keep our hearts from being overburdened by the things of this mortal life, whether in time of plenty or in time of want. Deliver us from persecution and sustain us from all tribulation, that our hearts may ever be fixed upon the true treasure of your grace. Accept the tithes and offerings we bring as part of our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for all of your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. In him and with him and through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our offertory, and you may put your offering in the offering basket on the table in the back if you'd like to do so either now or on your way out.
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.